Hello, my name is Claire, and you know what? Nothing gives me more pleasure than being an absolute dick. Whether it's being a master of sarcasm in Fallout 4 or being a jerk to every species in Mass Effect. Just sign me up, I'm down for the ride. But on a day when we're not torturing innocent NPCs or decimating epic medieval fantasy worlds with My Little Pony mods. Yeah, don't, don't, don't look at that. A game may come along and completely change our lives and everything we thought we knew about the world. And suddenly we feel inexplicably, undeniably, human. So just as much as they can make us a megalomaniacal tyrant, do video games actually have the capacity to turn us into the most uncanny thing of all? A good person? Well, hop on board and grab your nearest box of tissues because we are going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be blunt here. Video games are fun. Like, a lot of fun. Infiltrating a cargo train in Red Dead 2? Heckin' awesome. Grabbing ramen with your mates in Persona 5? The best. Doing unspeakable things to cows in Just Cause? An absolute blast! Sorry, I just, I couldn't resist. Whatever way you look at it, video games are designed with the intention to entertain, and the reason we play them is to be entertained. But the thing about things that are primarily known for being fun is that often it's the only way they're seen. The word game in itself derives from the ye olde English word gaming, which quite literally means joy, fun, and amusement. From an individual point of view, this is swell. We achieve personal satisfaction from taking time to wind down, to have fun. But from a cultural point of view, fun doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of what video games are capable of achieving. What if I told you that the same medium that allows us to do this is also capable of invoking social change. Okay, yes, with that comparison, it sounds baffling, but that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about. Whether you play online, single player, RPGs, JRPGs, platformers, shooters, looter shooters, to suffer, raid, torture, build, or create, we can all agree on one thing these experiences have in common they are interactive. Now, before you say nada, although I, I wouldn't be mad if you did, I want you to really think about what this means. We tend to throw the term around like the clever academics we are without really considering the broader connotations. So let's take things back to basics. Interactivity is a process requiring two things, the player's input and the world's response to it. So essentially, we have a world that not only allows us to escape into a complex narrative or connect with other people, but is also reciprocal, responsive to our actions, in tune with our presence as the key driver of change. Interactivity in all gives meaning to our role as the player. And yes, while interactivity is hella fun for obvious reasons, it also comes with an unexpected perk. Empathy! <laughs> sorry, I just can't, I can't get over that cow. <laughs> I'm, I'm so immature, I'm sorry. <clears throat> empathy! Hmm. Let's determine what empathy really means. In simplest terms, empathy is our innate ability to share the feelings of another person. A common misconception of empathy is that it's something some of us are just better at, but that's absolutely not the case. Though it doesn't always seem like it, empathy is a skill, something to help anchor us to the world and to form meaningful connections with others. It allows us to understand nonverbal cues, to more accurately predict the reactions and motivations of people in our lives, and is just all around a pretty empowering reminder of being human. Because yes, even I need a reminder of that fact. <laughs> it's important to establish that empathy is not the same as sympathy, which is only knowing what someone is feeling. The key difference is where video games come in. Here's a description from the Advances in Intelligent Systems and Computing Journal. Oh my god, that was a mouthful. In general terms, empathy defines the understanding and sharing the emotional state of another person, the projection of one's own personality into the personality of this other person, and to feel with the heart, see with the eyes, and listen with the ears of another person. Have you ever played a video game that has changed changed a value you once had, affected you so deeply that you find yourself unconsciously referring back to it in your everyday life, resonated with you so strongly that it added several points to your empathy skill tree? That's the mechanic of empathy, and there's actually a lot more subtlety to it than you might think. To really get to the heart of it, Eey. we need to ask ourselves, how does interactivity evoke empathy? The answer to that is in a little thing I like to call immersion. Immersion, as defined by our psychologist friends, is a state of deep mental involvement in which the subject may experience dissociation from the awareness of the physical world due to a shift in their attentional state. 
Whew, okay, that's a lot to unpack there, and you're probably wondering what this even means because I know I am. So let's start with a study in 2018 done by two researchers, Manuela Hafner and Jerowyn Jans. In exploring the effect of immersion in video games on people, they discovered some very interesting trends. Sorting these into three primary types of immersion, spatial, ludic, and affective, they identified how a human's primal tendency to accept without question the physics, mechanics, spaces, and storylines of an entirely virtual world can create an entirely new level of depth in our gaming experience. And the most fascinating consequence of all? This level of immersion has the power to heighten our susceptibility to persuasion. It's crazy how I harp on all the time about the power ultimately being in our hands, but every time we sit down for a session of God of War on PS4, we are totally at the mercy of its rules, its storyline, and its world. The combination of gameplay and interaction has us wrapped around its ginormous hammer-wielding fingers. Okay, I'm never using that metaphor again. And the experience we perceive as being real effectively has us in a state of transcendence, in total belief in the space we virtually occupy. When we're in a state of immersion and therefore more prone to being persuaded, it's no wonder empathy is a common result. But where does empathy come from? How does it fit within the virtual space? And most importantly, how do we as players tap into that empowering experience? Empathy is a complicated chemical response, and psychologists are still scratching their heads on what exactly goes on in our brains to make us feel it. Yeah, it's all well and good to say that I see this happen and feel pretty sad about it, but we're not here for surface level analysis. We want to know what empathy chemically is. Imagine you're consoling a mate who was this close to getting a PS5 console, but alas, is once again subjected to heartbreak after waiting in the Big W checkout for four hours. I feel you, I feel you. Our cerebral cortex, the delicious outermost layer of our brain that handles the higher functioning stuff like emotion and thought, goes to town. Driven by the emotion center of our brain, the anterior insular cortex, billions of neural networks fire off in a way that, get this, mirrors the same pathways triggered from our sad friend's reaction. So effectively, our brains quite literally emulate the same instinctive chemical response, just through our observation of it in others. Neurologists refer to this phenomenon as simulation theory, or if you're super hardcore, emotional contagion. And despite our awareness of it, there's still a huge gap in our understanding of why we're hardwired to emulate the feelings and experiences of other people. Which is why video games, in their potential to immerse, are a big deal. Because when passive observation alone is enough to evoke an empathetic response, think about what happens when we're not just watching these events unfold, but driving them. While empathy obviously isn't an essential mechanic for all genres, there's no doubt that all video games in some way, shape or form tell a story. And those stories are 99% of the time reflective of the real world. Although there are some exceptions. But the most beautiful thing is that regardless of how abstract or complex these world themes are, and regardless of our personal experience with them, the agency we're given to interact with them gives them deeper meaning to us. It makes these emotions and these stories ours too. Reflecting social issues and deeply complex themes in an entertaining format is a really hard thing to do. Not just because these subjects can be difficult to approach, but because they need to be translated very clearly into a ludic format. Or in less obnoxious terms, they need to be understood in terms of gameplay. Now, the first thing that can help contextualize gameplay is, obviously, narrative. Narratives function in games a little like how butter makes Vegemite on toast taste better. I mean, butter's I toast like that? What the fuck? What's the other way to butter toast? It contextualizes the flavor of gameplay and helps us to make sense of its rules. Here we go. Delicious. That is disgusting. When building on a story, narrative designers ask themselves, how can character, theme, and emotion be conveyed through something as mechanical and repetitive as gameplay? How does narrative link us, the holder of the controller, with the basic rules of its imagined world? An excellent example of how narrative can contextualize gameplay can be seen in Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, a gorgeous platformer developed by Starbreeze Studios. Be warned, there will be spoilers ahead for the storyline. Essentially, you control two brothers on a quest to save their dying father, with each bro assigned to a thumbstick to move them simultaneously through each level. The platforming and overall game design is built around the mechanic of teamwork and codependency. So when the story takes a tragic turn and the older brother Naya is killed, the gameplay just drives that gut punch right home by making you A, drag your brother's body to bury him, and B, finish the game with just one half of the controller in use. One brother. It's so sad, like you only have one half of the controller and you just feel so empty and it's just really sad. <laughs> 
Through the narrative, the purpose behind this mechanic is made more poignant than ever, and we can only cry through endless tears as we experience this loss firsthand. Another beautiful and thankfully happier example of the harmony between gameplay and narrative is in environmental storytelling. Seen in games like Unpacking and That Dragon Cancer, which okay, I take back is pretty sad, where a virtual space allows us to freely explore at our own pace, all while putting together the pieces of a greater story. And no matter how abstract the story it tells, somehow our engagement with it in this patient, carefree way makes it ours too. There's a second way social issues can be translated into games, and that's through something comms professor Christoph Klimt calls the frame of play. The best way to explain what this is is by giving you an example. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. And it starts with losing your mind. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is a critical game and pretty much the perfect example of how viscerally we can experience immersion in video games. Why? Because it doesn't just show us what it's like to live with a mental disorder, it has us living it. While narrative is the context of gameplay, Klimp's frame of play is essentially its logic. It's every itty bitty thing the game presents to us, from its audio, to its controls, to its graphics. Remember what I said about immersion having us fully accepting the rules of the game's world, no questions asked? Well, the frame of play is the space in which that happens. In other words, as long as we're in that space, we see everything within it as real. Developed by Ninja Theory, Hellblade places us in the shoes of Senua, a picked warrior venturing to bring her husband back from the dead. And you thought you were having a bad day. She suffers from psychosis, known as the darkness that haunts her journey, which means that it most definitely haunts ours too. Thanks to the frame of play, Senua's reality is our reality. Her hallucinations materialize into enemies for us to fight. Her delusions become barriers that we have to solve. And the super unsettling voices that plague her thoughts speak directly to us, telling us, where to go, questioning everything we do. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I'm good, yeah. I'm really, I'm really good. <laughs> Through gameplay, Senua's hallucinations are embedded within our agency, and her psychotic perception is normalized in the game space. And the scariest thing is that due to the rules of the gameplay, we have to accept this reality in order to proceed through it. We're forced to adapt, exactly like how empathy has us adapting to the experiences of others. As said by Hellblade's creative director, Tamim Antoniades, it is not so easy to see the mental suffering and trauma of severe mental illness. But what if we could find a way to see it? Games are capable of drawing you in for hours on end, playing the role of a character who is different from you, experiencing their perspective, and actively involving you in a world that functions with a different set of rules. I actually wrote an essay on Hellblade at uni once, and it's pretty much the reason I wanted to make this video. And it's not because I was so impacted by Senua's story or completely transfixed by the gameplay, although those are very, like, legit reasons, but because the first thing I did when I finished it was Google, what is psychosis? Social change is closely connected with our everyday lives, occurring when a good portion of a society's members change their behavior in response to something, whether it's an event, a movement, or hey, a video game. Games have the power to spark discussion, to foster understanding through interaction and curiosity from engagement. <laughs> I feel like I'm reading a campaign speech or something. They can make complex and multifaceted social topics familiar and easy to understand, and can personalize the experiences of other people even when we have no prior connection with them. At the end of the day, it's impossible to measure clearly whether or not video games alone can make us nicer, considerate, more empathetic people. All I can say for sure is that when I finished my first playthrough of Hellblade, I wanted to learn more about how mental illness can change someone's perceptions. I felt part of the family and their struggles in that dragon cancer, and I learned how to overcome the feeling of loss and grief to make it to the end of Brothers A Tale of Two Sons. Yes, and it still haunts me, okay? That may not be measurable, but what matters is that we're challenged to experience something new, to understand an aspect of the world from a different point of view, to step into the shoes of someone who is going through something we'll likely never understand. It's through broadening our horizons, expanding our appreciation, and receiving a new perspective that will encourage us to look more deeply and passionately into the societies we live in. So sure, empathy can be learned, and games can be a fantastic teacher, but it's when we take that empathy beyond the screen, applying open-mindedness and compassion to our everyday lives, where the real achievement lies.
As always, thank you so much for watching. I had a blast making this one, as I tend to say that about all my videos. <laughs> While I've heard the idea of empathy in video games popping up a lot, and there's clearly a lot of discussion around it, it actually struck me how little research has been done into the field in a more mainstream sense. Because I really think that regardless of whether we're playing, you know, a game for impact or a particularly noteworthy empathetic game, I think just games in general have the power to make us more empathetic people in nature and to teach us empathy in ways that are more subtle than you might think. As I always like to say, I am so open for any suggestions for further videos. If there's anything you'd like to look into deeper about your favorite games, please comment below. I am always excited to hear more topic ideas for me to explore. And with that out of the way, I've been playing through God of War again. I have the essentials, so I will see you in several dozen cups of teas later. <laughs> Bye!